As indie game creators, you love sharing the adventures you've created with others. But how do you maximize your reach and get your games into the hands of as many players as possible? You may want to have your game carried by game retailers, but if you haven't already broken into retail distribution, where should you begin? And how can you optimize your game for success in a retail environment? Today, we're speaking with experts who will demystify and offer advice on that process. This panel is brought to you by Crowdfunder, the creator-friendly crowdfunding platform. Crowdfunder is free to use, dedicated to the success of its creators, and serious about positive social impact. Crowdfunder's Tabletop Nonstop 2024, a special spotlight on tabletop games, starts in February in conjunction with Zine Month. To learn more about Crowdfunder, please visit www.crowdfundr.com. No e in it. It's F-U-N-D-R.com. All right. Hello and welcome. Our first guest today is Darby Pack. She is an actual play performer uh, and game designer and community manager. She works at a brick and mortar tabletop game store in Los Angeles, California, sharing her love of games with her community. Hello, Darby. Hi. Happy to be and here. next we have Taylor Hubler, the inventory manager at Indie Press Revolution. IPR, and if you're not familiar with them, you'll get very familiar with them over the next half hour. A network of creator publishers devoted to bringing you the latest innovations in tabletop role playing and story games. Launched in 2004 with seven member publishers, IPR has grown to connect more than 100 small press tabletop role playing and story game companies to retailers on five continents conventions and individual customers. And I'm James Kerr from Radio James Games, who encourages weirdness in game design. I've also freelanced many books for Pendlehaven Press, and thank you for joining me today. Oh, Taylor, I didn't give you a hi. Hello. Hello, Taylor. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With our panel of experts today, what we want to explore is the world of games at retail. If you're wondering, how do I sell my game through retailers? You're in the right place. Uh, this is a I, I said this before we started recording, it's a little bit of a dry subject, but we've got a great group of people here to liven it up and demystify the process so it doesn't seem so scary and imposing. So if you're getting started in tabletop role-playing games and you think, oh, retailing, it, 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 distribution is such a distant dream, it's so off far on the horizon, it's not. It's not far off on the horizon. You can do it, you can make it happen, yeah. and we will make it happen in the next half hour. So... uh let's get into the skinny of it what do we mean when we talk about game creation so you've you've gone to the effort of getting your game made like you've got your your crazy wonderful wild idea and your cool new dice mechanic or whatever and you you go and you crowdfund it or you kickstart it or you crowdfunder it or you backer kitted it and uh, you've made it a reality when we're talking about distribution taylor i think you're the best person for a definition here what does it mean to distribute your game what does that mean these days? Well, it's then we'll good, complicate it, but let's start yeah. with the traditional. Well, uh, it means that you're going to get your game from uh, from your hands into the hands of players that you've never even met or talked to before. That's, that's probably the best way that I could describe distribution. Absolutely. Now, in the way that things have gotten complicated lately, traditional distribution is you pay a company to send your games out to friendly local game stores, your FLGSs and your, your retailers, and uh, sometimes even to conventions. Uh, and and then away it goes. Digital distribution has become a real thing in the last 20 years, and it's a market force to be reckoned with. Uh, so when we're talking about distribution, we're talking about print distribution, but we're also talking about digital distribution. And just because you're in one doesn't mean you have to be in the other. Uh, That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, we're talking today about games. So tabletop role-playing games, you know, but that space, there's a lot of Venn diagram with board games and with card games and with uh, parlor games and novelty games. And and uh, the, the intersection between tabletop role-playing games and story games is pretty, you know, wonderfully murky and, and, mm -hmm. and mixed up. So we're talking about all those things. Taylor, what kind of games does Indie Press Revolution distribute? Indie Press Revolution focuses mostly on independently made role-playing games. Uh, we do have a couple that kind of bleed into 
the board game uh, uh, genre. Out, like that, that there's still role playing game elements in there, but the focus that IPR is uh, completely on is, uh, or mostly on, is role playing games. Sitting down at a table with some friends, pretending to be somebody else, using game aids to uh, to move through a scenario. I like that you said game aids and not dice. <laughs> I, I object to dice being a necessary <laughs> component of the of the process. Well, we we just restocked Dread, which doesn't use dice. It uses a tumbling tower or a Jenga tower. So a copyright free Jenga tower. A, a copyright free yeah. tumbling Copy. tower. Yes. yes. <laughs> and Darby, you're on another end of this. You're you're a tabletop role playing game publisher, and please plug your stuff. Uh, but also, you have a retail experience that you're drawing from that can shed light on a whole different area of this industry. Is that correct? Yeah, I work at a local game store in um, LA, and we we do a lot of stocking of like in like role playing games, but also board games, uh, living card games, trading card games, uh, a lot of different gaming aids and accessories. Uh, so a lot on the hey, now that the distributor has gotten your game to me, I'm getting it into the hands of uh, other people. Now the natural, I guess, traditional flow of this is you make something, you get it printed, and then you hand it off to a distributor who hands it off to a retailer and every step of the line, everybody's getting a little bit of a piece of the pie so that the whole industry works is the idea. Print on demand complicates this a little bit. So Taylor, does Indie Press Revolution have print on demand books? We... We have books that people have used print on demand to print and then send to us, if that makes any sense. Yes. Uh, so we, yeah. So then the publisher themselves, you creating the game, it, you're acting like your own printer kind of by ordering a print on demand order, and then you can send it to Indie Press Revolution just the same. Correct. And because we, we, we are working mostly with the independent creators, a lot of times we only get at most 50 copies of a game for some of the smaller people. So print on demand actually makes sense for, you know, uh, I can only get you 20 copies of this, you know, um, if we think that it's worth trying to sell those 20 copies, we absolutely will take it. And if you use print on demand, like, you know, that's, that's a great option for, for small batches. So, so my parents owned a an ind small independent bookstore. It's not as cool as Darby's bookstore, I'm sure. Uh, because they mostly sold murder mysteries and Harlequin romances to old ladies in the small town. But occasionally they'd have consignment books come in. People would would print on demand their books and then they would throw them in a car and like drive around the country saying, will you sell my book? That is an arduous and horrible process and I don't wish it on anyone. Uh, Darby, do you, have you ever dealt with consignment books at your FLGS? Uh, a couple, actually. Um, but they're local, on, right? They're not like driving around the country with... Mostly local. Mm -hmm. On occasion, we'll get phone calls or we'll get emails from people being like, hey, I have this game. Would you be willing to like stock it? Like, here's how you would get a hold of it. Uh, different products as well. Uh, most notably for me, I there was a game that um, from the publisher who came in who was a local and was like, hey, I have a copy of my game. I'm just going to like leave this with you. Uh, if you like it, you can. This is our website that you can get it from, or you can get it from these distributors. And that was the Wild Sea uh, for Mythwork Publishing. Um, and then Ray, we that book is gorgeous, <laughs> and so we brought that book in. And then and then Ray came back uh, a couple months ago and was like, "Here's a here's a copy of Cyber Plus Punk. Uh, what do you think?" I'm like, "I can order it. <laughs> that's that's what I think." Well, I mean, and, it's and we carry you... both of those, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> so those are you're right. Those are fantastic products. Yeah. The li the line I'm trying to to the thread I'm trying to make here is having a distributor takes a cut, <laughs> but it makes a huge difference in the retail life of your book as opposed to bringing it into the shop yourselves. Your FLGS is is has more of an F than I think a lot of them do. Uh, a lot of them will not do consignment books, period. Yeah. Uh, and it can be a, you can sit yourself in front of a huge phone tree of hundreds of F FLGSs and just phone them like crazy. Sorry, in case it's not clear, FLGS is friendly local game store. And I was being cute with the app. Yeah. Uh, so the advantage of having a traditional distributor, even one as like 
funky and cool and hip and new as as the IPR is that they do that work for you. Mm -hmm. um, myself, my book, Fight to Survive, Role-Playing Martial Arts Meets Heart is distributed through IPR. And I get emails all the time from people in the weirdest countries who IPR has has sold to. I've gotten emails from Spain and from uh, from the Middle East, different parts of the Middle East, and from Brazil, who of people who have who are, got their book through a retailer through IPR, and I didn't have to do it. I didn't yeah. have to bring my book to Brazil in order to get it out there and get people playing. So it's a wonderful. Uh, that's what we mean. We're, we're still defining distributor. That's what we mean when we mean distributor, right? Is, uh -huh. is going from something like IPR and getting into the hands of, of an FL LGS like Darby. And Taylor, if you're not going to toot your horn enough that I will, uh, Indie Press Revolution is, is one of the best resources for any tabletop nerd on this planet. Oh, um, I, yeah. I, and I agree. Um, I, uh, uh, I know that we've been sitting down and trying to talk to uh, different people to try to get into even more uh, markets. Uh, I know Jason really wants to try to get into like West Africa right now. <laughs> and he would love to get into like, I think there's some Central American uh, markets that he wants to get into. But um, uh, just outside of, well, step back a little bit. My personal background actually with, with tabletop role playing games started with Pathfinder. And I did a lot of Pathfinder uh, freelance writing, and I'm still kind of connected into a lot of a lot of people that have done uh, publishing for for that. Um, and when I mentioned like, yeah, I might be working for 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 IPR, all of them were very excited. All of them were like, that's that's a great place. Um, like, it's crazy that you weren't aware of it before this, Taylor. Yeah. You know, um, and I've heard nothing but great things uh, uh, about IPR outside of you know, outside of the the people that I thought um, uh, would have been directly connected to it. Uh, so yeah, it's, yeah. So IPR is not a take all comers distributor, right? You go through a vetting process uh, and you email them and you say, hey, this is the cool thing I've got. This is what I want to do. Um, you know, give them a digital copy and, and they look it over and see if it fits within the catalog, right? Mm -hmm. That being said, um, I encourage everybody to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, if you've got a, if you've got a tabletop role-playing game, you should, you should send it to any press revolution. Um, yes. and it makes it easier on a retailer end to not have to go through like, I mean, IPR is one of the big ones. It's, it makes it so easy if you're like, Hey, my game is on, here's a physical copy of my game. If you are going to game stores and be like, Hey, do you want to buy my game? It's already at this, like distributor that you may already order from like you don't need to go to my individual website every single time to like order my game that can that has been something that slowed us down from reaching individuals who are coming to us with like their product because it's like i have to specifically remember and on top of all the other weekly orderings that we're doing go through and specifically order from your website for this like one maybe one or two lines of product it makes well, it a lot be, easier in a retail Let's end. be frank, Darby. Most mm -hmm. shops won't bother, mm -hmm. right? Most of them will not bother to do that. They'll say, we have these 10 distributors and we're going to order from Diamond and we're going to order from Lion Rampant and we're going to order from... We're or from uh, Alliance. Like, we're ordered like, from Asmodee. Like, yeah. yeah like, like IPR is yay big that it's, it's worth dealing with. Now, Indie Press Revolution is not the only game in town. Uh, there, there are other, uh, online retailers, um, but outside of Canada, you're definitely my favorite. Um, all right. So let's like, I think we've, we've constructed the landscape. This is kind of what the, the, the world is like. You don't have to distribute your game in this way, but I think it's, it's fun and it's very low. Um, it's a low cost of entry. You do have to ship your game to the Indie Press Revolution warehouses in this case in order to get it out distributed, which can sometimes be a circus. I'm in Canada. I have to cross the border to do it. Um, you know, shipping is is an arm and a leg. Uh, in fact, it's probably cheaper to me to get something shipped or something printed locally and then shipped local to the IPR warehouse than it is to print it in Canada and have it shipped down. So there's a bit of orchestration. And when some tabletop role-playing game publishers are new to the space they have uh very new questions like oh i have to pay to ship yes yep. yes 
because not only do you have to pay to ship, sometimes those packages can go awry and get eaten by seagulls or end up in the ocean or whatever else. Or happens sit to in packages. shipping containers off of the coast of Port of Los Angeles for six to eight months, which is what happened yeah. with WizKid, a lot of the WizKid minis that we were trying to bring in early earlier in like the time that I was working at my shop, like 2021, 2022, they were stuck off of the port of Los Angeles for six, eight months sitting in a shipping container that nobody could get to. And it's like, yeah, and, yeah <laughs> we've had we similar, do. we've had similar experiences with, with publishers in the UK, uh, like just getting stuff this, la let's see, last November, we finally had it come in, but we were expecting it to come in like, like the year before. So <laughs> yeah, there's things like that can happen. The, the most common things that I, I see as the inventory manager, what my, what my primary job is, is actually take that incoming uh, and inspect it, record it, let the publisher know that we received it, and then get it into our inventory, figure out where physically where it needs to be um, so that you know we can go and, and move it into the other processes. Uh, but the most common thing that I find is a lot of a lot of publishers who are very who are especially who are new to this don't understand that there isn't some magical wand that's being waved at the post office that magically transport teleports your product to us. There's a whole process. There's a, about a dozen hands that these 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 packages move through, uh, and quite often they're moving through quickly and. Um, Things can get caught in sorting machines. Things can get dropped. Um, I actually used to work with the for the postal service, um, and sometimes you get people that that aren't kind to the packaging. They'll they'll see something that says something like "handle with love" written on the package, and they'll go, "Oh, that's cute," and literally drop kick it across. Love. The I hate love. <laughs> yeah. How dare you tell me how to do my job? Um, so you know. Packages, the, the packaging itself often comes in really beaten up. And uh, the thing that I'm constantly telling new publishers is, you know, double package, put put a little bit more into, I know it, it, it's into your cost, but just put a little bit more into that packaging and make sure that what's inside is protected and we'll have something to sell. Otherwise, we're setting aside a lot in, yeah. in some of these, these cases. And T Taylor, I... I have to pick your brain because I've got you here. Um, do you find that pe when people shrink wrap the books, mm -hmm. that helps protect them a lot? Ah, uh, because it's it, like it, it's like it four depends. cents on the book or something, right? Yeah. And does it actually make a difference? Some people swear by it. Some people, some publishers, I'm specifically saying, swear by it, and some sure. say, eh, it doesn't make a difference. Right? Uh, it, it's going to depend. Like it really does matter about what what are we talking about in terms of the physical book. Um, I think if it's a if it's a nice hardcover, uh, shrink wrapping actually is is probably a good idea because you're going to have uh, less of a chance of that that book which has some weight to it get scratches on it as it's being moved in and out of inventory. Uh, if it's a lighter zine, um, only shrink wrap it if it's got multiple parts. Oh, that's 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 true. Uh, and we have had some zines come in with multiple parts where it's like wax paper. Like they're in wax paper bags, and that that unfortunately doesn't really work. That gets that just doesn't look great. Um, we're having a really hard time getting that out to retailers in a way that actually looks marketable. Um, so I would shrink wrapping definitely recommend for like multiple part scenes, um, hard like heavy hard covers that you want nice pristine covers on when they get to uh, to customers. For the most part, though, I I don't really find shrink wrapping to be helpful uh outside of those cases so yeah. so the the what you do need is double walls and false corners right that's correct mm -hmm. uh if you're going to package uh and send it to us double box uh or add additional um cardboard to the inside and reinforce those corners either in inside the box or outside the box find some way to reinforce those corners um I, I did a, a panel at Metatopia where I actually went through the mathematical physic, physics equations on pressure, force, acceleration uh, to kind of show that like when you drop something, it's going to matter like the like how small the area is that it falls on. So corners are going to be more damaged than than most um, and like how you can actually 
change the equations just with how you package. If you really reinforce those corners more than like I'd say 99 out of 100 times, like it, your product will come in great. So, okay. So, two prong question, like dovetailing into this nicely. Mm -hmm. I want to know from Taylor first, how do you make a book attractive to a distributor? Like how do we ah, okay. publishers make it attractive? And then we'll transition into Darby and say, Darby, how do we make it attractive on the shelf? Well, ah. um, well how do we make it attractive so that you want to pick it up from the distributor? Because like there's a chain going on here. So Taylor, what do you think? Well, I, I think a lot of my answer is probably going to be a lot of what Darby says. Um, we, we really like to see in, in the physical design um, something something that can be put on a shelf uh, because we do go to, to conventions ourselves and we have to also kind of act as a retail um, in those cases. Uh, we want something that we can put on a shelf that people are going to be able to to look at and uh, instantly recognize it for what it is. Um, that means that the the title really should be at like maybe the top third of the product. Um, you should have your name on it. You should have a role playing game or at least a very short description, um, if not on the front cover on the back. Um, uh, you should have some blurb on the back that tells me what the game is. So I don't have to actually open it up and like keep paging through to figure out, you know, what I'm looking at. Um, attractive art always is great. Um, uh, I really like to see personally, uh, the name of the publisher somewhere on the, on the back, uh, instead of just, just the logo. Uh, we had one product come in a couple of years ago. And it took me forever to figure out who the publisher was because it wasn't listed anywhere inside the book. It just had the symbol. It just had their logo on, on the cover. And I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, so um, uh, also I really like to see people credited for their work. Um, who like list somewhere, who wrote it, who did the artwork, who did the layout, who did the editing. Uh, because oftentimes, uh, as somebody who actually does game design myself on the side, um, I want to know who did, who did those things so that if maybe in the future a project I'm doing uh, would fit for them, you know, I, I know who to reach out to. Um, you know, also, it's great to be able to pick up a book at a game store or a convention and turn to somebody and say, look, this is me, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have some other opinions about how to lay out a, a role-playing game, but that's that's much more of like that's not necessarily a matter for distribution or, or retailing. That's just much more of a personal opinion on how to lay out your core rule books and stuff like that. Well, rather rather than being scared mm -hmm. as a publisher, <clears throat> yeah. I'm surprised that you would even accept a book without a masthead, like without a proper copyright information and like are you taking things without ISBN numbers? I guess that we, isn't we, as necessary as it used to be. We uh, IPR does not require ISBN numbers or uh, barcodes. Okay. Um, we understand that there might be a, a uh, for some some of our publishers that could be actually a kind of a barrier um, in terms of the cost. Um, we uh, we we do like the quirky little things, um, and and so we do have a couple things that are literally printed in people's houses on their personal printers and then hand assembled. Uh, they don't actually go through a printer. Uh, and some of those games have been fantastic and wonderful and worth like we felt worthwhile to distribute. Um, and so kind of not having that requirement allows us to, to kind of open up more. The, the eye is sincere. Yes. Oh, the, yes. The, the indie uh, part is very sincere for, for IPR. Yeah. OK, Darby. What's attractive on the shelf? A lot. <laughs> Surprisingly, if you could believe it, a lot of the things that are uh, interesting to a distributor, um, good art. Uh, I, I, I struggle a lot with games that don't have descriptions on the back of them. It's not that the game itself is not good. It just makes it very hard from uh, a retailer perspective to sell a game if there's nothing on the back of it that I'm able that someone is able to pick up and read. There's a couple games that I've that we've brought in from I from IPR or indie games that don't have any description on the back. Uh, and it's like a huge pet peeve of mine. <laughs> if you're publishing your game, please put a description or something like in the in the first cover of the pay of the book or on the back of it that's like a description of your game because uh 
then it makes it hard as a retailer that means I have to kind of babysit and watch and like talk people through this game which is probably a fantastic and wonderful game that I now have to kind of hand sell and that takes up a lot of like mental space and uh, workflow energy to then constantly kind of be circling back to these games to give an example from the board game world uh like weird city games made these wonderful games canopy and leaf they are fantastic great games the deluxe edition copies of their games don't have anything on the back it's just art there's no player count there's no is this cooperative or not how long does it take to play it is just art and we had to print out little signs to put in front of and next to the game to be like, this is what the game is like. Like, this is how you play the game. This is all the information that you should already know about the game, but we can't, but it's not printed on the back. <laughs> and that makes it really hard on a retailer end if I can't, if I have to like hand sell the game constantly, if that makes sense. That um, makes sense. Not everything can be the Beatles White Album, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's a dated reference at this point, but um, it, I'd like to make this actionable. So if mm -hmm. you are a tabletop role-playing game publisher and you're hearing these wonderfully very specific notes about what it is you should include in your book, it is easy to type into Google and say, what do I need on a masthead? What do I need on the back of my book? Or just take a book off your shelf and look at the back and see the kind of things they do. Um, we've got some wonderful conventions in the industry that have come up over the last number of years, like putting number of players on the back, you know, under uh, like above the uh, the ISBN number or, or whatever else, or just space for it. And mm -hmm. I, I'm in love with how the kind of stringent requirements of traditional publishing are breaking down in really interesting ways and quality is bubbling up to the surface. Uh, and through curation and a good um, support for the industry, we've been able to get wonderful, fantastic, interesting gonzo titles out there doing really cool things. And we'll get to Crowdfunder about that in a little bit. But um, hey, you guys are exciting me. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the, the, the bubble and the cycle, because the fact is, traditional publishing wants you to print a thousand copies or they don't want to talk to you particularly. Uh, print on demand means you can print even one copy. Who cares? Digital printing and other large format presses that aren't like four color plates have cropped up in the last 15 years, making smaller runs more possible. It's more possible to do 100, 300, whatever. Most tabletop role-playing games only sell 500 copies in their lifetime, period. And if, you know, Indie Press Revolution is asking for 50 and you manage to send, uh, well, then you got 450 in your bedroom <laughs> in boxes. So let's talk a little bit about the, the life cycle of what that goes through. You send things to Indie Press Revolution, uh, correct me and, and steer me in the right direction here, uh, Taylor, but the largest glut of sales happens within the first four months of the title right? Yes. Yes. And that's you, correct. Might, you might ask for a second run, like a second fulfillment of that, but unless it becomes like a, a cult hit of the year or wins in any or something that it usually just trickles out from there. Right. That is correct. Um, yeah, we, we have a few titles that um, we thought we're going to end up being able to sustain uh, themselves after uh, the initial Kickstarter, um, but we still have like a whole palette of them, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then we have we have games that like we kind of looked at and we're like, that's that's kind of neat. Let's see where this goes. Let's just do fifty copies, and we can't keep it stocked. Like we have all we have actually four pallets of a product that we move very quickly, and we know we're going to get through those four pallets in the next like six months. Um, so it it can be very unpredictable sometimes. But generally, you are correct. Your sales are going to be very front loaded. You're going to have um, a lot of sales there, and then it's going to peter out. And you might get a few sales, you know, a year from then. You know, you might get a few people looking for physical copies five years from then. Uh, but unless you are something like like the Quiet Year, I think is a great example of just a consistent seller. Thousand year old vampire as well. Yeah, right thousand year old so. vampire. Yeah. Um, there's there's one that we've had for a bit now that I think might might end up being that called Raccoon Sky Pirates. Um, yeah, 
Like I love Raccoon uh, Sky Pirates. Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot to love about Raccoon Sky Pirates, and I like. I'm pretty certain that's going to be one of the ones that we'll always have, you know, sales for. But for the most part, yeah, it 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 peters out. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, not just how great the game is, uh, because these are all great games that do this, but how well you're able to maintain your marketing and and selling yourself, really. Um, uh, uh, Tim Hutchings, yeah, Tim Hutchings of Thousand Year Vampire, right? Yeah, uh, he's just fantastic at, at at really getting himself out there to conventions. Uh, he's he's on point with some of his social media. Um, he's really good at um, you know of really selling himself and putting out a product that you know can maintain those those sales. Um, you know, the same can be said for uh, uh, Avery Adler with uh, uh, sorry, The Quiet Year. Um, Avery's really good about selling themselves and continuing up marketing of that game um, and taking advantage of the momentum that that game, you know, produced. Um, but not everybody's like that. Like I know personally myself in my experience of, of game design and trying to, you know, self-publish on itch, uh, I'm terrible at selling myself. Uh, I got a, a few sales in the beginning and I was happy with that. And I haven't really done anything in trying to market myself after that. And I haven't got any sales. So that's, I think that's, that's mostly the secret there uh, is, is are you the type of person that's going to be able to continue that momentum and put yourself out there when you've got that hit that, you know, you can keep, you can keep marketing. So, yeah. We're establishing a kind of baseline, right? So let's say you're doing a moderate amount of marketing. That's the kind of cycle you would expect. It's probably three year cycle overall generally yeah. speaking but the long tail can continue uh do you find the long tail continues digitally more than it does in print i don't know if i have an answer for that one because most of my experience is with print okay um i i haven't really been able to look behind the curtain on the digital side of things personally jason our ceo might be able to answer that question better mostly because he also is the publisher for Hero um, and has a lot more experience with things like that. Um, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if I can answer, really answer that question. Well, I just brought that up because I think it's important to note that um, IPR is not just a print distributor. IPR is also a digital marketplace, right? Like where people can, download, can, can purchase PDFs. Uh, so... But this cycle, this boom and bust cycle for publishing is no different on the shelves than it is for the distributor, right? You, do you notice the same patterns, Darby, for what's going on, on on your end, on the ground? Definitely like ebb and flow patterns. There's some games like I have to fight so hard to keep in stock or we'll just order. I mean, at this point, I think for our store, we order like 50 copies of Thousand Year Old Vampire every single time we order from IPR because we're going to like... Uh, we're going to blast through them at some point, like we'll get through them and then suddenly there won't be any copies left and it's better to just have, it's an evergreen title and then there are some games where I'm like, this is great, this looks really cool. No one touches it. <laughs> um, well, your game could be cool. It could, it's just only two or three games a year are going to touch the popular tabletop role playing game Zeitgeist. Yeah. Right. And a quiet year did that. A thousand year old vampire did that. Um, you know, just because you've even won the, this or that award doesn't mean necessarily your game is going to have staying power, but it's the same if we were talking about fiction books, right? Mm -hmm. Like Or board it, games, it, like, exactly. uh, Wingspan, when it first came out, nobody could keep, nobody could keep it on their shelves forever. Um, and people think people were reselling it initially, like $120 for a game that is now like a standard staple in most stores, including like Target and Walmart, um. It's it's an interesting it's interesting to see how people ebb and flow. Also, like it depends on where you are. Like indie games do so well in our store. We'll bring in new games and they sell out like instantly. But I know that's not necessarily the same elsewhere because I'm we're based in Los Angeles. There's so many game designers. Like so, you cat, you'll hit a game designer in in LA, but maybe not necessarily. I don't think game designers appreciate being hit by cats. <laughs> It depends. If you're playing boop, uh, you might appreciate being hit by a cat. Uh, but I think getting back to what Taylor said, it's about culture and it's about the kind of culture you have going on around you. Uh, and if you can cultivate that culture online to continue your sales or if, and I think it's important to, to note that 
that's not always wise anyway. Like with something like The Quiet Year, like I totally get it. Like that's a that's a game that should be around 50 years from now. Uh, with something like Thousand Year Old Vampire, like I'm get it. It's, it's one of the most gorgeous things on my shelf. But um, putting your heart and soul into one one book, uh, I don't know is always wise. If you think about the three, like kind of the three year ebb and flow, boom and bust life cycle, and bringing in another game and another game and another game is usually the better solution. Taylor, I don't know if you can peek behind the curtain this much, but how much changes with a supplementary game because there's some people who believe that follow-up games don't actually benefit their principal game and other people who will say oh it's not a living game line unless it has you know all of these books according to it the indie sphere leans away from that that one but yeah. uh what's what's I, i'm just really curious about your side of the pond what's the perspective well i think um, right now, IPR is actually looking to change some of our guidelines to actually like avoid a lot of supplements. Um, we we actually have quite a few supplements from Mortborg and Mothership uh, that had those those first initial sales, but haven't really been strong uh, after those initial sales. Um, and and so we've been we've been looking more into well, do we even want to accept supplements if we're not even carrying the main game? Um, is that we're not actually sure if that's a smart business decision on our end. Um, but I do think that there is some benefit uh, to doing to doing supplements in helping maintain your um, your like your support base. Uh, and I know, uh, I mean, we're going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to say the D word, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, one of the reasons why Dungeons and Dragons was so successful was because it had a lot of supplementary material. That might be where that mentality is coming from. And uh, Mortborg and Mothership, um, I think, are also seeing a lot of success because they were able to uh, to have a, a license out there for people to create their own their own stuff. Um, and there's a few okay. other examples I think I could probably pull from from the IPR inventory. But um, uh, for the most part, the supplements themselves aren't going to sell nearly as well as the uh, the main game. Uh, mostly because like not everybody's going to play that adventure. Not everybody's going to use that rule set, right? Um, uh, I know with Hero, it definitely helps in maintaining like its lifetime, um, in keeping its its fan base, uh, its support base there to to constantly have some more material to to look at, to consider, and to play around with. It does expand the the sandbox, um, but I think the thing that's going to help game creators more is just keep creating games. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to Thousand Year Old Vampire, Tim Hutchings has several other products out there that are just as fantastic and as amazing. Uh, and in fact, I've gotten me several times as the inventory manager wondering, did somebody send this to us by mistake? This is this can't be a game. And sure enough, I open it up, I see Tim Hutchings, and I'm like, oh, you rascal, you got me. This isn't actually a geological study of, of a cave. Mm -hmm. You know, this is actually a game. Um, Avery Adler, going back to, you know, uh, Quiet Year. Avery Adler's con like, has several very good games out there. Uh, uh, J Dragon, who did Wander Home, um, and uh, Yuzeba's Bed and Breakfast, I think it is that's that's coming up. Yep. They uh, he's constant or sorry, not. I apologize. Jay is constantly um, uh, creating new stuff and working on new things and getting new stuff out there, and that's giving more life to the stuff before. Because if you like what they're currently putting out, you're going to look back and you want to see what the catalog is like. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be much more of a, 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 a way to success than just relying on one game and putting out supplements. Yeah. And as a retailer, I have very often, we brought in, for example, Lighthouse at the End of the World. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful solo game really cool vibe we brought that in it kept we could not keep it on the shelf for longer than like five days uh every time we brought it in 
So when I saw that they had not only one other game, Void 1680, uh, but they also had killer ratings, we brought both those copies in. Both now are doing really well. Um, as a retailer, knowing like, hey, this person's games, I know what their kind of ethos is. Again, is very helpful because Tim Hutchings, like, a collection, what is it, the the drawing game that he has is... A collection of like, useful exercises. Yeah, just a gorgeous book to look at. And I'm like, I know Tim Hutchings is going to make something really avant-garde, off the wall, but also a really fabulous and interesting... I want to pick his brain so bad. Um, <laughs> just a fabulous game. Um, so we brought, we bring them in. Old Mars Cave is his other one, the study of, a, you know, a thousand-year-old cave or the archaeological study of a cave something i forget what the actual name is but um we brought that in just because it's like tim hutchings games are cool they'll i think it'll do great here it's i agree with taylor it's less about the supplements and being like compendium expansion um and more like hey games by a publisher spencer stark is um a name that people are following but they'll like pick out games because i mean now at this point he's pretty prolific with alice is missing icarus Kindle obscura like uh, people are following people, a lot of people I find nowadays are following like game designers or game like publishing groups, as opposed to like this specific game and its supplements. Um, because it, it also sucks on a retailer end when I bring in a game and I bring in a couple of the supplements and then the supplements sit on the shelf forever and I can't keep the core game in stock and nobody is picking up these expansions. And as cool as these expansions might be, Without the core game, they're functionally useless. <laughs> now, I think it's important to point out um, the currency of a cult of celebrity for an indie game designer is obvious, especially online. Mm -hmm. And I think it's clear that that resonates with retailers and with distributors. But I'd like to make a note that if you are a new tabletop role-playing game designer, um, I don't want anyone going away thinking that they have to have a name for themselves in order to uh, to get picked up by a distributor like IPR and and in order to sell at retail. The, so long as you are doing some kind of basic marketing on your game, like uh, yeah. and and just communicating what your game's message is well, but like you know, like describe what it is on the back. Make sure that it 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 says tabletop role playing game on it if it might be confused for a novel like on the description like on on the distributors make sure you're putting a lot of as much information as maybe information that you wouldn't necessarily put on the back of the book putting that information in the description just looking at ipr's website clicking on people's um descriptions for the product being able to see like not only this is the vibe of the game um sometimes people include pictures of what the layout looks like inside or they'll like here are some of the components that come along with the game they give like dialect with its cards and stuff and showing what those cards look like that is helpful for me as a person looking to bring in these games to know what not only what your game looks like um but also a vibe of the game how it plays how many people it plays like is this a gmless game is this like a is this a game that can be played competitively? Is this a game that I need extra components for in order to play this game? All of that is so useful and so important for me um, looking to bring in games to know that uh, because then I can tell other people on staff like, hey, this game, super cool. These are like, here are the little like soundbite information for you because not everyone is going to be able to play every single game that comes into the store but me being able to go hey the skeletons here's like a quick little like blast i love um, the skeletons i love skeletons it. is a great yes. game it's fantastic <laughs> and you know what makes it easy is that i'm like on the on the back of the game it says one to six players can be gmless <laughs> here like here is the vibe and that makes it so much easier also for retailers even if it's not me specifically selling the game my other coworkers can pick up the game look at the back of it and then now they have that in their back pocket to be able to like, I hear you're looking for a game that isn't uh, the D word that I can present to you. That does also not have fast, an ampersand. <laughs> that doesn't have an ampersand in it. Yeah. And also you can play by yourself. Here is this list of games because I got to get a description of it. Um, but the, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, James, to kind of, to kind of uh, also kind of touch on what you just uh, were, were saying, 
uh, one of my first pieces of advice that was given to me when I first got into game design was you're your own roadblock. Um, if you think that you're not going to get accepted by a publisher and you're going to let that stop you, then you're not going to get accepted by that publisher. Uh, same goes with IPR. Like, reach out to us. Let us know that you have a game. Let us let us look at it. Let us be the ones that you know that say, "Hey, I'm sorry, we're not going to take it." We'll give you the reasons why, and we'll be we'll be as friendly and as kind and as as helpful as we can. If if it's something that we feel that you could rework and come back to us later, we'll like we'll let you know. We'll let you know what what you would need to do for that. Um, but I think one of my favorite examples of somebody who wasn't their own roadblock. Um, I cannot remember the publisher. I think it was Guisarm Games, uh, but they they walked up to uh, to Nick, our social media manager at a convention, with these hand printed, hand put together zines, uh, very much looked like they were made in somebody's house, and said, "These are my games. Will you distribute them?" And James looked through them and looked at them and said, "These are fantastic." Um, and we, you know, we we ended up distributing them. We got like a hundred copies that they printed out in their in on in their home printer, and they hand put together. Um, and uh, you know, they were great games. Like that person, absolutely was great at making sure that that game got in front of in front of us. Uh, but if you if you have it in your head, oh, they're not going to accept us. I'm not going to do it anyways. Well, then you're you're your own roadblock there. Um, you're you're the barrier to entry. Uh, just just send it. Just let us know. Reach out to us. Email us. Let us know you have a game. Let us know you want us to consider it. We'll let you know whether or not you know it, it meets our criteria. So. so it sounds like from a distribution perspective and from a retail perspective, one of the most important aspects of this whole process is knowing how, I'm not even going to say marketing yourself well, but knowing how to present your content, which I don't want to make look like this big mountain to climb. Again, you can take any book off your shelf, take the three or four books off your shelf, see what they're all doing the same on the back and the kind of attitude they're adopting. You don't have to sell your soul into the kingdom of buzzwords and business speak in order to make a compelling uh, elevator pitch for your game. You know, mm -hmm. like what, what really gets me about skeletons, for instance, is I, I guess because I'm a me mechanical nerd, it uses silence as a mechanic. And I think that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that would have sold me on it instantly. Okay, oh, yeah. we've gone past time because I've had too <laughs> too much of a good time here. Uh, so are there any final words that either of you want to leave with prospective tabletop role-playing game publishers? Oh, we should talk about Crowdfunder. So February, Crowdfunder is doing the tabletop nonstop uh, event as part of zine month, even though tabletops don't have to be zines. Uh, and throughout the month of February, I have my game that's up. Darby, you're going to have a game, I think. Yes? Uh, I don't know if I'm I'm going to have a game, but okay. I am. My participation in it is through through panels like this. Absolutely, and IPR is also supporting. Uh, yes, uh, there have been games from Crowdfunder that that we carry, and uh, I'm certain that there'll be something from that February event that we'll end up having. My mother's our, kitchen, our I think, was a yeah. Crowdfunder game that uh, is now on IPR. Well, there we go. All right. Well, I encourage everyone to go to Crowdfunder and check out the stuff that's happening in February. Or if you are watching this and you are a tabletop role-playing game developer or a would-be developer and you think, gee, this is all more friendly and supportive than I thought it would be, which is the right message, then absolutely go over to Crowdfunder and see if that's going to be right for you for crowdfunding your campaign. Because IPR is glorious and does not have to be scary. We've, we've got Taylor here and retailers like Darby are glorious and don't have to be scary. Uh, everybody in this entire process wants you to succeed. Yes. Okay. I'd like to thank my guests for joining me today. I've got Darby Pack from Chaotic Darby and Taylor Hubler from the Indie Press Revolution. Today we discussed how to successfully sell your game at retail, which seems to be to boil down to have a cool idea, present it reasonably well, have enthusiasm, <laughs> and people will be there to help you along the way. I'm James Kerr, and on behalf of crowdfunder.com, thank you for listening. <laughs>